my fellow Americans, the State of the Union is bleak and belabored by an over-intrusive government that oppresses Americans with the highest corporate tax rate in all the world. We are disenchanted, disillusioned, and depressed. The government regulates light bulbs, toothpaste, the federal government regulates automobiles, health care. The federal government reg regulates refrigerators, stoves, washers, dryers, toilets, showers, and even how farmers spread manure over their land. So now we are stuck in a quagmire of manure. Our debt is larger than our entire gross domestic product. And if it were possible to tax every single one of you 100% for one year straight, it would not even cover the debt that we've accumulated, and that's evil. I see a cliff in the distance, and instead of turning around, or even tapping the brake. We push the accelerator. And we are going to make sure that this country, that we, the people of the United States of America, will crash and burn in such a way that it will make the fall of Rome appear as nothing but a mere footnote in history. My fellow Americans, the problems we face are real. And why are we facing this? Why? Why the people of America? Why should this happen to the wealthiest, most powerful people on planet Earth? I can tell you it's not because we need a political revival. It's not because we need an economic revival. It's not because we need a revival of the collective optimism. It is because we need a spiritual revival. What does it mean to have a spiritual revival? What it means is that if you're watching me and you've not yet believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then now is the time to consider this may be your last chance to get to consider such matters. John 16, 18 through 9 says, When God the Holy Spirit comes, He will convince the world concerning sin, concerning sin because they do not believe in Christ. Do you believe in Christ? John 3, 15 states that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. John 3.16 states, For God loved the world so much that He gave His uniquely born Son so that whosoever believes in Him should never perish but have eternal life. John 3.18 states that he who believes in Christ is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique Son of God. John 3.36 states, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not believe shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 6, 47 states, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. John eleven twenty five 25 states, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. And then very important is John 20, 31. But these have been written to you that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that believing you might have life through his person. And again, John eleven twenty six. 26. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Anyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. There's a clause there. 
and it says, anyone who lives. How many more days do you have on the earth? Do you know? I certainly have no clue as to when I'm going to depart. It could be tonight. It could be before the end of this message, and wouldn't that make a spectacular message? It could be a year from now, 30 years from now, I have no idea. And in the same manner you have no idea when life will be taken from you. So while you live, now's your chance. Once you die, the chance is gone. Oh, you may believe after you die because you realize, oops, made a mistake. More than likely, you'll just be screaming, not thinking very much at all except ouch, in a much more stern way, of course. But while you live right now, in other words, what this is saying is you need to make your choice right now. Think about it. I can't make you do it, but I can certainly lay it on the line for you. You could watch this message, hate it, turn around, walk downstairs and fall on your head and break your neck. It's over for you. Or you could watch this message, believe in Christ, fall down the stairs and break your neck and go to be with the Lord. Choice is yours. It's really that simple. For in John 20, 31, it says, But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Or Acts 16, 31a, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now there is an apostasy in this country that says you have to work for salvation. That God is impressed with, with what we can do with our hands. God is impressed with what we can do with our vocal cords by saying, Amen and Hallelujah. That God is impressed by whatever we can do in terms of our talents and abilities. He's not impressed with that. He gave us those things. We can't impress God with that which He gave us. I know we're like kids. You give a kid a toy, he likes to impress the parents with the toy and what he can do with it. But the truth is, we're grown. And we have to make a choice now to just give up all those works. Those works are meaningless. They're holding your back. In fact, you're making it harder on yourself. The Apostle Paul says so himself. In Romans 4, 4 through 5, where he states, Now to the one who works for salvation, his wages are calculated. Oh, they're calculated. Not on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. In other words, get out your calculator every time you try to work for salvation. Put a minus sign in front of it and say, minus 432 works today, minus 570 works tomorrow, minus 300 works the next day. And then it's Monday and you're all into work, so it's minus 100 works on Monday. So then Sunday it's minus 20,000 works on Sunday. Either way, it's minus, 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 minus. You're digging yourself a hole. And the only one who can get you out of that hole is that voice that calls down to you and says, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Stop working. Wouldn't you rather rest? I would. Are you insane? Some people are. Some people are so insane that they want to work their way into heaven and they drive themselves crazy. Because all they do is heap upon themselves debt upon debt upon debt that they can never repay. And they will die without Christ, without hope, and without
without eternal life. I don't care how hard they worked. And I don't care how everyone around them said how holy they were because of how hard they worked. That's religion. There's all types of religion around the world where people work to be saved. The Buddhist does his thing. The Muslim does his thing. The Jew does his thing. But what do they do? They work. They dig a hole. They dig a hole they can't get out of. But Jesus is still calling down into that hole. Come unto me, all ye who... Uh, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He calls out over and over again. But they don't listen. Why? Well, if you've worked for salvation for 20 straight years and you come to realize, finally, God the Holy Spirit makes it known to you that all of those 20 years was a waste, that's a lot to give up. You want to hang on to it. You want to say, but I worked so hard. And in arrogance, you want to say, it can't be that easy. It can't be. I worked so hard and I was so much better than everyone else. I saw everyone else doing all sorts of things that I would never think of doing. How in the world I worked so hard to be so holy and to be what you think is holy. Well, that's all gone. Christ did all the work. You must decrease. Christ must increase which means you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way of salvation. That's why our Lord said that narrow is the way. Narrow is the gate. How narrow is it? It's as narrow as one decision. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. What is the wide gate? Work, 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 work your way to heaven. You say, what do you mean working your way to heaven is the wide gate? Isn't that what all the world's doing? Isn't that what the Buddhist is doing? Isn't that what the Muslim is doing? Isn't that what the people who practice Shinto in Japan are doing? They're working and working and working to impress God. God's not impressed at all. God is only impressed with the work of our Lord Jesus Christ who while he was on the cross cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew why, but he said it for you and for me and for our benefit so that we would understand that he was forsaken for you and for me and there's nothing we can do for our salvation. He did it all. And for you to think that you can even work one tittle one tiddly bit for salvation is a slap in the Lord's face. What you're saying is, Lord, you didn't do enough. Let me add a little to it. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you be a traitor to our Lord and therefore a traitor to the United States of America? For Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 states, For you've been saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Stop your boasting. You haven't done a thing. Jesus Christ has done it all. It is what it is. And that comes out in the Greek of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. In the Greek of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it says, You've been saved by grace through faith, and it is what it is. In other words, you've been saved, and you can't do anything to change it. It is what it is. So that's what we need in this country is a revival. Not a revival of religion, but a revival of people who know that the only way of salvation is faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, if you have believed, then 
continue to listen. If you've not, then you can continue to listen anyway. Maybe you'll decide something different a little later. But for those of you who have, who have believed already, you have a major responsibility to your country. You have the most serious responsibility to your country than anyone else. You're commanded by Scripture to grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are to learn the mechanics of how to grow in grace and in knowledge. You are to do as King David and meditate on God's Word both day and night. You say, but I go to church on Sunday. I even go to prayer meeting on Wednesday every now and then. And I might even do a few other things throughout the week. Now let me tell you something. A precedent was set in the Garden of Eden when it comes to Bible class. In the cool of the evening, our Lord Jesus Christ would come to minister to both Adam and Eve on a nightly basis. Every single night. He didn't even have a Saturday off. And he gave them the doctrine that they needed during that time of their dispensation. And then when it came to the time of Acts, as we moved into the dispensation of the church age, we had the disciples who would meet every night. They would have Bible class, but not only that. After Bible class, oftentimes they would go into a prayer session that would last for three, four hours. We're soft and weak spiritually as a country, and that's why we've become soft and weak as a country, period. Just as the world sees us weak, the world laughs at us now. A weak, soft country. And don't blame the politicians. Americans are the first to blame a politician, but Americans are the first to elect that politician they blame. Every politician you blame has been elected by a majority of the people. You're, you're fussing at the wrong people. You haven't gotten to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is there's no spiritual revival. None. And when I say spiritual revival, yes, we need those who have not believed in Christ to believe. But even more so, we need those who have already believed in Christ to make number one priority in their life the learning and the retention of the Word of God or the learning of Bible doctrine. There are some people who do not like those two words and you are traitors. Bible doctrine is mentioned throughout Scripture. And it's mentioned more times in the King James than in any other version. Bible doctrine's for you. It's for your benefit. To say you don't like it is to say you don't like God. And it's to say I'm a traitor to my country. I'll still show you grace even though you think in those ways. Now in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, there's a way out for our country, just as there was a way out for the country of Israel. It says, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, what does that mean? The first act of humility in the spiritual way of life is to name your sins to God. 1 John 1, 9, if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Or in Psalm 35, when David said, I named my sin to God and to God alone. That's what it means when it says, if we will humble ourselves and pray. Then there's another phrase. And seek my face. How do you seek God's face? By doing what you're doing now. Listening to a message. Absorbing the message. 
believing the message. And then you do that on a daily basis. Now I might not be the person that you listen to for the rest of your life. I wouldn't wish it on you. But there's other pastors out there who teach the Word of God. Joe Griffin, Bobby Thane, Colonel Thane, who is on, who he's passed away, but you can get his tapes, MP3s, whatnot. There are others out there teaching the Word of God. I might not be your type personality. I know I'm not for a lot. I'm a little too harsh. A little too rough around the edges. And that's just because of the way I was raised. I, I did not grow up around all of the fluffiness. I don't understand the fluffiness. The fluffiness seems weak to me. And all around the world, they look at America and they see fluffiness and it looks very, very weak to them too. We're in deep trouble. We've got the Chinese plotting to take us over. We've got Arabs wanting to do all sorts of harms to us. We find ourselves in a very precarious situation as believers. And we're losing out because we fail to rebound. We fail to do what 2 Chronicles 7.14 says. We fail to humble ourselves and pray. We failed to seek the face of God by making the Word of God number one priority in, in the life. Then it says, and turn from their evil ways. Well, that's the logical progression. Once you start learning Bible doctrine, you turn from your evil ways. And what are some of the evil ways? You could think in terms of socialism. Bible doctrine will change that in a hurry. You could think in terms of it's okay to spend fifteen and a half trillion dollars without a thought. That is evil. That is theft. And these people in this country who get up and talk about how they spend this money and how they're going to spend more and more, it's evil. It's theft. They have no intention of paying it back, and a lot of that debt Americans are buying, along with the Chinese, but if you look at it closely, it's mostly Americans buying our own debt. And to pay it back? No way. It's called theft. It's evil. It's a collective evil. It's a whole nation that is full of rot and corruption. And if you fall into that idea of rich against poor, of take from the rich and give to the poor, then you've fallen into a thinking of evil based upon envy. Abraham was rich. Job was rich. And at the time, if you were an evil person, you would think, we need to take from Abraham, he has too much, and give to the poor. Or we need to take from Job, who has too much, and give to the poor. Evil, evil thinking. And people get so far into that evil thinking, they'll even say, well, Abraham went around in a tent. It's not a tent like you put up when you go up in the hills somewhere or the mountains. Abraham's tent was like a mansion in which he had servants running all around doing whatever Abraham wanted. And I guarantee you his tent even had a system of air conditioning. It was luxury. Abraham was wealthy and he used his luxury. Don't you for one moment ever hate a rich person. In fact, the Bible tells you, never question why the wicked prosper. And don't question why the righteous prosper. Abraham prospered, he's righteous. Don't question it. As soon as you question it, you fall into that evil. 
But if you turn from those evil ways of envy, do you see how it plays into the whole picture? But if this, if this nation would turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, I will heal their land. Who will heal our land? The Lord Jesus Christ. Hope is not in a politician. Hope is not in a man or a woman. Hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope is in God's Word, which is the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's now time for you to get serious about taking in the Word of God. For you have the omnipotent power of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit available to you which means you have it within your power to do the world all over again. And when your work is done, you will slip the surly bonds of earth and touch the face of God. May God continue to bless the United States of America.